as well as part two of the Squallet Solo Run. That Squallet part two. Guys, guys, I already did that. Like, I posted the first one like eight months ago. You really think I would wait eight months to do the second part of one of the most popular videos on my channel? Nah, <laughs> of course. Oh, wait. Richard? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, Richard? Get your butt over here right now. Yep. Yep, we're doing it. The Chip Tide Show Season 2 starts right now. Chip Tribe, it's me, Chips, here with the season two premiere of the Chip Tide Show. And I thought we'd start this season off with a bang with the sequel to by far the most popular episode of the original season. If you don't know what I'm talking about, way back in January, I decided to try to beat the entirety of Pokemon Shield with just a Squovit named Bobby. Unfortunately, I only made it past Alistair until I ran out of time, and let me tell you, it was quite the doozy. I recommend watching part one before you watch this one because, well, you know, that's usually how it works with numbers. But if you need a refresher, and I can't blame you, it was literally eight months ago, here's the TLDR. My goal was to beat Leon with a single Squovit. Not Greedent, Squovit. Bobby was my chosen champion, and for the most part, it wasn't too bad. Well, the beginning at least. I was able to grind super easily by beating some max raid battles and having little Bobby gorge himself on some EXP candies. I also learned that the move Spit Up is straight up broken. Basically, my main strategy up to this point has been to set up stockpiles at the start of every battle to buff up my defenses to ensure I can live attacks, body slam and bite everything in sight until the end of the battle where I absolutely obliterate the last poor sap with a base 300 stab move. So yeah, basically the entire first part was a tiny squirrel killing everything in sight by throwing up on them. It wasn't all smooth sailing, I had a lot of problems in the beginning with moves like Growl and Sand Attack because I wasn't able to switch out and reset my stats. Kabu definitely took a few years off my life, but the real main event of the first episode was Alistair, since his ghost types were immune to my two strongest attacks, Body Slam and Spit Up, and Bite never really did as much as I hoped it would. It took many, many tries, but eventually, little Bobby conquered the nightmare of Alistair, and we set course for the top of the mountain. Also, he was level 51 by the end, so I might have been a tad bit overleveled. Cool? Cool. Alright, and with that out of the way, part 2 starts right now. So the very first thing I did was get Body Slam and Spit Up back, since thank the lord I didn't have to worry about any freaking ghost types anymore. I decided to get rid of Bite, which I pretty much immediately regretted because I soon got into a battle with the human trash bag that is Bede and his team of psychics. But when you have something as powerful as Bobby on your side, something as silly as type advantages is irrelevant. The old one-two punch of body slam and spit up was more than enough to throw this guy in the dumpster where he belongs. He gets disowned by his mentor, there's some hidden statues, blah blah blah. Look, Bobby and I aren't here for the story. We're here to conquer. After that is one of the coolest sections of the game, Glimwood Tangle, and as I called it in my notes, <clears throat> Be Something Town. There wasn't much to do here but the gym, so I wasted no time getting right in there. But before the actual battle, I have to address something that I somehow neglected in the first part. The ball guy! Look, I know in a solo run you don't need any Pokeballs, and you can't even sell most of the ones he gives you, so he is literally pointless in this. But I mean, come on, he's the freaking best! So you better believe I'm going to be talking to him every single time. And with that very important business taken care of, here we are. The episode has only just begun, and it's already time for the first gym. 
but I'm not worried. After conquering the nightmare of Alistair, this should be a breeze, right? Right? It was misdirection. Bobby blew right through her little minions without breaking a sweat, and the actual gym battle was a little bit tougher, but honestly, it was more annoying than anything. I got all of her questions right, but didn't count on the fact that Opal is a dirty freaking cheater who got salty about the fact that she's old, but that's besides the point. Her wheezing wasn't too bad, Bobby got poisoned, but I had plenty of items to deal with it. The real problem was the Mawile, who not only had Intimidate to lower my attack for the rest of the battle, but it also spammed Iron Defenses, so my dig did basically nothing. It wasn't doing a whole lot of damage to me, but I was more worried about running out of PP than anything. But then, I discovered an X attack that I had picked up somewhere lying in my bag. I usually don't like to use these types of items because, well, I don't know why to be honest, but I figured if Opal's gonna cheat, then I don't feel so bad. I also didn't realize that X items boost your stats by two stages, so the rest of the battle was cake. Literally. After the battle, Opal offered to take me back to Hammerlock, well, I said, hell no, you're the scariest person I've ever seen in my life, and I flew back myself. Not much to do here, Bead gets kidnapped, yada yada yada, and pretty soon I've found myself in the first Hop battle of the episode. And side note, Hop is the best rival the Pokemon franchise has ever seen, and it's not even that close. I mean, come on, the dude's got a full-fledged character arc. He also happens to have a Trevenant that likes to spam Confuse Ray and totally didn't want to make me bash my head against the wall because I still didn't have Bite. To make matters worse, I got paralyzed off a of Fat Bear Body Slam and then absolutely obliterated by a Heatmore with Fire Lash, which, you know, is probably the only time anyone has ever had a problem with a Heatmore, so that's nice. After getting booted back to the Pokemon Center, I decided to bite the proverbial bullet and put Bite back on over Dig, despite the fact that I chose Sobble, so Hop had a Cinderace waiting in the wings. But in the end, it didn't really matter much. The Trevenant was not a problem at all, added a little Body Slam off with the Snorlax in one, and even managed to get rid of my Paralysis in time to body the Heatmore. A couple of spit-ups was all it took to seal the deal. With our first real challenge behind us, me and Bobby set our sights on Kerchester? Sir Chester? Not really sure how to pronounce it, but nothing really of note happened along the way. No, literally, I don't have a single note. There's also not a whole lot to do in the city itself, so it's gym time. But not before talking to the ball guy for good luck, of course. Thankfully, I wasn't playing sword because dealing with Papa Gordy's fighting types would have been a huge problem. Nope, it's just Melanie and her army of ice. No problem. I went in it with the same old strat, setting up three stockpiles ASAP, and she led with a Frostmoth who immediately set up the hail, lowered my attack, and did a ton of damage with Bug Buzz. Fun. But despite the lowered attack, Body Slam, or Old Reliable as I like to call it, still did decent damage. Honestly, there wasn't a ton of strategy in this battle. I just kept clicking Body Slam and healing up when I needed to until the moth was dead. Same goes for her Darmanitan, and I even managed to get a lucky paralysis as its Zen mode activated. I got a little confused by the SQ and its Ice Face ability, but again, I just sort of kept clicking Body Slam until it was dead. Last up was the G Max Lapras, who actually turned out to be a pretty big problem. Because of the Aurora Veil that got set up when it used G Max Resonance, my Max Strike did basically nothing. But have no fear, for all this time, Bobby was only using 10% of his power, and I had a trick up my up my sleeve. Bite becomes max darkness, which lowers the target's special defense. So I did that twice, healed up after Dynamax was over, and at this point, Aurora Veil was gone, and Lapras fell to a spit up like all the rest. And after that hard fought battle, we had some dinner with Sonya to talk about a poster or something. Riveting. And then it was time for another hot battle. And look, Hop, I love you, man. I really do. But did you really have to start with a double that immediately proceeded to spam defense crawls and growls? Did you really have to do that? So even though I usually like to save my spit-ups to the end to keep my defense boosts, I was basically forced to rely entirely on it and spent the whole battle resetting my stockpiles just to attack once. 
I was able to kill the Dubwool and was all set up for the Cinderace when it burned me and then crit me and I died. Again. Hop, my man, you are killing me here. The second time, I decided to be patient and save my spit up, even if it meant it took a freaking hour to kill that dumb sheep. But thankfully, Hop was either dumb or felt bad for me, because he didn't spam Growl as much and let me keep some of my attack for the whole battle. See, I told you he was a good guy. Another thing that made this a lot easier than it would have been was the natural hail that persisted throughout the whole battle, which honestly did more work than I did. In the time it took me to get all set up, the double already had some good damage on it, but then I guess Hop didn't want me having too good of a day because he used a super potion right on the brink of death and made me whittle him down all over again. But I managed to keep my cool and hold on to the spit ups for his Cinderace, who I'd like to point out immediately got another crit, though thankfully Bobby was able to survive this time and blew that dumb rabbit away with an almighty barf. His Snorlax was up next, but before anything I had to get my stockpiles back up. Easier said than done, because I got paralyzed off of a body slam and was immobilized about a million times. It seriously took me so long to get a measly three stockpiles off that by the time I did, the Snorlax was almost dead from the hail already and I had burned through a lot of my potions. Snorlax went down in short order, but if I thought I was in the clear, oh, oh, oh no, I was wrong. Because you see, his Corviknight ate up Bobby's attacks like a freaking breakfast buffet. Luckily, he couldn't do much damage in return, so it was a slow war of attrition, and all I can say is thank God for the hail and my dwindling supply of potions. His final Pokemon was a Pinkurchin, which honestly was a little anticlimactic and went down to a single spit up. But hey, I'm not complaining. After that, I needed a freaking glass of water. Hot man, I am serious. He is no joke. I have no idea how Trash Bag managed to beat him so well. Probably something to do with the fact that he had more than just a squirrel on his team, but who's to say? Thankfully, next up was a nice and easy trek towards Spike Moth, where again, not much happened. We did run into some Team Yell grunts, one of whom had a Pangoro that Bobby handled like a champ, no problem. When we got to the city, it was on lockdown. Relatable. But apparently no one in this huge crowd thought to just go around the wall. Then, there was a battle with the far inferior rival, Marnie. Don't at me, she's boring. And apparently about five times weaker than Hop, because Bobby straight embarrassed her. Her Lipard went down easy, but got a Torment off before it died, which apparently never goes away, so that was a little annoying to deal with. Her Scrafty got a hard lesson in hubris after it used Swagger on Bobby, who didn't give a crap about those little ducks and blew that pants-wearing lizard away. Next up was Toxcroak, who did, well, literally the exact same thing. So by the time Moropeko came out, Bobby was at plus four and basically an unstoppable machine. Moropeko got renamed to Flat Stanley, and we were on our way. Before heading into the next gym, I swapped Bite Out for Dig once again, assuming it wouldn't be much help in the Dark Gym. And then, something unexpected happens. You're not allowed to set foot into this gym without having at least two Pokemon in your party. I was dubious, but I saw no other option. I grabbed Ted, our old starter, but vowed that he would never see the light of battle no matter what it took. I also forgot that the whole party gets experience in this game, so Ted accidentally got a couple of levels in the back, but it wasn't the end of the world. I cautiously made my way through the gym, and all was going smoothly. Ted stayed firmly in the back. That is, until these two showed up. Team Yell Grunt and Gym Trainer Joshua. Surely, they could have only come from the deepest rings of hell, because nothing so vile, so evil, could spawn on this earth. Why? Because they challenge you to a doubles battle. No reason, literally just here to ruin the run. And it was too late to back out. Everyone knows it is a law that you can't run from a trainer battle. So here I was. Ted was on the field, and I had no idea what to do. Sure, I could just fire off some weak attack and hope they killed me first. But what if they didn't? If Ted here did even one point of damage, the dream is dead. This is a Squovit solo run, not a mostly Squovit solo run with a little assist from Ted, no! 
No, I had to think of some way around this or die trying. Now, normally, in a trainer battle, you can just throw a Pokeball to burn a turn, they'll bat it away, crisis averted. But since this is a solo run, I never bought any Pokeballs, and I just sold all the ones I picked up, so my pockets were empty. The ball guy! Yes! Yes, I knew there was a reason for talking to this freaking guy, this savior. There was a reason he was waiting for me in every gym. There was a reason he wouldn't let me sell any of the balls he gave me. He knew. He was trying to prepare me for this very moment. So, ball guy, this one's for you. Huh. Yeah, so it turns out this trick doesn't work in a double battle, and I figured out that you can just use a potion or berry or something on Ted's turn to burn it instead, so that was a little anticlimactic. But with that exceedingly disappointing battle behind us, it was time for the penultimate gym. There's no Dynamaxing or anything to worry about here, so it should be a pretty straightforward battle, right? He leads with a Scrafty, which has got Intimidate and Sand Attack, are you kidding? After getting my stockpiles up, I had to make an executive decision to just fire off a spit up early before all my accuracy was gone, and had to set them back up when the Obstagon came out. Obstruct scared me, since it had the potential to lower my defense for the rest of the battle if I used a physical attack on it, so I decided to spit up this guy as well. It protected the first one, which meant I had to set them back up again before finally landing one, which it lived! Now. I was in a really bad spot. I had no defenses, and I could never get the opportunity to set them back up because I was caught in a heal loop. The Hax Gods must have been on a lunch break or something because it never landed any crits until it eventually ran out of throat chops, at which point I was in the clear. I set the stockpiles up for a fourth time before knocking it out, so I was all raring to go by the time Malamar hit the field, though I did have to use an ether to get some PP back for Body Slam. But it seems my brief respite was over, if you can call it that, because the Hex Gods returned in full force and I proceeded to miss about a billion moves. The Malamar had a bunch of high crit ratio moves that had me peeing my pants in terror, but thankfully Bobby's will to win was stronger than the Hex and it never got any. Now there was only one Pokemon left, Skuntank. I still had my stockpiles but he immediately toxic and screeched me. I was on a timer. Dig didn't do more than half, so if I didn't do something drastic, I was done for. I had to try the spit up. If the sand attacks got the better of me and Bobby missed, my defenses would be completely gone and we would surely lose. But I had no other choice. But you should know by this point, Bobby never misses when it counts. In fact, it was Bobby who dodged, embarrassing the freaking Skun Tank before ending its career for good. And just like that, there was only one badge left. The end was in sight. The journey got interrupted for a quick second. I don't know, something about wild Pokemon Dynamaxing and wreaking havoc on countless civilians. But I told you, Bobby doesn't care about no story. He's a squirrel. Can't even freaking read. But it doesn't even matter, because unlike every other adult in the Pokemon universe, Leon does his job and handles it, meaning we were in the clear to beeline for Hammerlock City Castle, home of the 8th and final gym. Now I knew Raihan was going to be a tough cookie, but I wasn't prepared for just how tough this cookie would be. Once again, this gym is home to some vile double battles, so it looks like Ted is going to be joining the team for just a little bit longer. Also, after the ordeal that was the last gym, I said screw the ball guy. Some wounds never truly heal, you know? Now normally I gloss over the little pre-shows, but this one was actually a bit problematic. It seems pretty simple at first, just three double battles. I've already learned how to deal with these in the last gym, so I wasn't worried. In fact, I thought it was a blessing in disguise. Ted would die in the first battle, and then I could just leave him dead in the back of the party and keep the true spirit of the solo run alive. But, as always, things didn't go quite that smooth. Because for some reason, the game forces you to have at least two active Pokemon in order to progress within the gym, meaning I had to leave and buy some revives just to get through the whole thing. This is 
actually an advantage for me because it basically means Bobby gets to dodge a free attack at the start of every battle, but I don't want their pity. Bobby has defeated far more difficult challenges in the past, and he'll surely face far more difficult in the future. But if they insist on patronizing me, I suppose there's nothing to be done. But another reason why I wanted to touch on the gym trainers this time is that they were freaking hard. Turns out taking on two different trainers at once with a single squirrel is not the easiest thing in the world. I know, who could have guessed? So instead of throwing myself against the wall over and over again, I decided to do some nice and easy preemptive training. Or at least I thought I was. Remember how I said in the last episode that I used max raid battles to grind faster? Well, what I didn't know is that the strength of the raid bosses are based on your level, but the strength of your allies is apparently not. Basically, that meant my CPU buddies got bodied, revived, and then bodied again until I got thrown out. Great! Luckily, I was able to find some weaker raids to beat and got to level 63 before I said screw it and went back in. And now folks, it's time for the main event. All we have to do is defeat the hardest gym leader in the game in a double battle with a single squirrel. Easy, right? No! No, in fact, it was pretty freaking hard. It made Alistair look like freaking youngster Joey over there, but I'm getting ahead of myself. He leads with a Flygon and Gigalith, and already we have a problem. Flygon has Breaking Swipe, which lowers my attack. I need to set up some stockpiles at the start of the battle, or else I'll die immediately, meaning there is no way I can somehow take out the Flygon before it has a chance to absolutely tank my attack. To make things even worse, Body Press from Gigalith does a crap ton of damage, even with the stockpiles. I was basically stuck constantly healing and occasionally doing a point or two of damage until the Flygon ran out of breaking swipes and I was safe to bust out some more X attacks to get back to normal. Finally, after about 20 minutes of fighting just to survive, no joke, it was time to actually start the battle. I decided to target down the Gigalith since Flygon was already down to three usable moves. It still took a while, but eventually the Gigalith went down and the Sandaconda soon after without too much problem. Though, not before paralyzing Bobby in the process. I was feeling pretty good at this point, all things considered. I had Dig, so I was pretty confident I could take out his Duraludon in short order and then finally finish off the Flygon. Ha, <sighs> look at that guy. So blissfully unaware of the hell he was about to go through. <sighs> you see, what I didn't know is that Raihan had a secret weapon. A trap card of his own. This whole time, I thought I was doing well, but I was really just playing into his hand all along. And when the time was right, he sprung his trap. My greatest nightmare. The very thing I thought I avoided with Gordy all that time ago. Max Knuckle. Sure, it didn't do that much damage, all things considered, but there are some things far more terrifying than damage. It gets an attack boost, that's what I'm trying to get at. And to make matters worse, remember our old friends the Hax Gods? Well, they decided to crash the party and Bobby got paralyzed twice, and then I spent the third turn of Dynamaxing healing, so I basically wasted the whole thing. That spelled the beginning of the end. A plus three Duraludon proved to be too much to handle, and I got caught in a heal loop before Flygon of all things landed a crit, and that was that. I was disheartened for certain, but not all hope was lost. I went back to the wild area and got a few more levels, restocked on some items and X attacks, and went back in for round two. And it went even worse than the last time. I used the same strategy to start off by stalling out all of the Flygon's breaking swipes, but the Gigalith got a crit right off the bat which I barely lived. Not a good sign. I was able to take out the Gigalith, but I got flustered and didn't account for the fact that Sandakana's Sand Tomb hit twice when using Dig, and Bobby fell once again. At this point, I was confused, dejected, and downright hopeless. Every time we came across a battle we couldn't beat in the past, Bobby and I would just grind, come back, and blow it away. And yet we did that, and did even worse. How could that be possible? And then, I came to a realization. 
Maybe, just maybe, the answer was right there. It wasn't possible. Beating Pokemon Shield with just a single Squovit simply cannot be done. All this time, the Hacks Gods were fighting me, not to keep me from winning, but to save me the heartache later on. Maybe it's time for me to take Bobby and go home. No. No, that is not how this story will end. It may be impossible to beat Pokemon Shield with a regular Squovit, but Bobby is not a regular Squovit. Every hurdle that was set for him, he conquered. Sure, it may have taken a few tries, but he came out on top all the same. Do you know how? Because he never gave up. And neither will I. Hey. Ball guy, do me a favor and tell the hacks guys where they can shove their so-called help. We've got a badge to win. My strategy for the start of the battle was sound, so I decided to stick with it. Just set up some stockpiles, heal as often as I need to, and wait for the Flygon to run out of breaking swipes. I even looked up how much PP it had and kept track just to be certain that it was out. Unfortunately, it did get a defense drop on the first crunch after breaking swipes, meaning Bobby was fighting at a deficit for the rest of the battle. But was Bobby phased by this? Not one bit. In fact, he spat in the face of the Hacks Gods and said, do your worst. Because defense is irrelevant when you've got heart. Heart? and a lot of potions. I used the X attacks to reset the breaking swipes and went to work. The Gigalith went down in short order and I was very careful about the sand tombs from the Sandakana this time. I also made sure to get rid of any glare related paralysis before taking it out so I could go into the Duraludon clean. I didn't want to take any chances. And apparently Bobby's taunt on the Hax God worked because it was in fact he who got the paralysis off of a body slam, meaning I could guarantee outspeed the weird snake before any glare shenanigans ensued. Finally, it was time to take on the fearsome building of a Pokemon once again. But this time, I did something that some may call reckless, others just reckless enough to work. I didn't Dynamax when Raihan did. Instead, I used Dig so that I could avoid some of his max knuckles and negate some of his attack boosts. It wasn't until he went back to normal that Bobby unleashed his full power. Two max quakes was all it took to seal the deal. I used my last turn to heal up just in case. Bobby had come this far and I wasn't taking any chances. Now it was finally time to face down the Flygon that had been standing there taunting us the entire battle. Bobby unleashed one last mighty spit up, his most powerful yet, and with an emphatic crit, he stamped his name into the history books. Raihan was slain, and all eight badges were finally ours. Now, all that was left was the long road to the Pokemon League, and a challenging road 
it would be. But, my friends, that story is going to have to wait until part 3. Look, this script is 15 pages long. God knows this video is going to be too long as it is. But, I promise I will not wait another 8 months to finish it off. I think. But, in the meantime, that brings the Season 2 premiere of The Chip Tide Show to a close. If you enjoyed or have any suggestions on how to make the show better, let me know in the comments section down below. I am always looking for ways to improve. New episodes of the show go up about every three weeks, so you gotta subscribe so you don't miss out. But if you don't want to wait, there's a playlist of all of Season 1 right there, and a bunch of other Let's Plays and stuff right there, so there's plenty to keep you busy in the meantime. But I will see you guys soon for the next episode, which I promise will be a lot shorter than this one. But until then, don't forget to take it easy.